Hey, so glad to be back up here again. It's been a while. So if, uh, uh, if you haven't seen me up here before, my name is Josh. I'm pastor here. And uh, yes, I've been off on baby leave, which has been great because getting used to number four has definitely been an adjustment. Um, I, I've told this joke a few times, so I'll say it again. So Ezra, I mean Ezra, ooh, Zion, this is, this, is a prob- this is a common problem now in our house when no one gets the right name the first time. <laughs> Zion, our newborn, is very passionate about, um, very passionate about uh, human connection because he just wants to be held all the time. And he's also a good advocate for what he believes in because he will cry. Like, I, I thought the first three knew how to cry. I was wrong. So, so wrong. Um, the, the, he's got it to an art. But now he's, he's turned a corner. He's doing great. I'm sure a duck dive here, there, everywhere. And I forgot as well, heading back into the parental fog, um, the tiredness hits a little bit different. So if I mix up words or say something wrong, sorry. Um, but it's good to be back here. In all seriousness, I really do want to say huge thanks uh, to John Jenks, to Brad Lewis, to Brad Patterson, to Derek Wilson, to Ann Clues, to Jeff Gomez, who for the past um, couple of months have been able to be up here bringing us some great teaching, words of application as well. It has been a huge blessing to just know that there's some great men and women of God out there who can encourage us in our faith. Isn't that good? I think it's so good. And it's also great to hear from other perspectives, different voices, and yeah, it's just really encouraging for us. So, where are we to now? We are actually heading into a new series. Uh, You can see it up there. A Child is Born. As we approach Christmas this season, I thought it would be great to just camp out at one particular narrative we find in Luke chapter 2. And we're going to be spending our time there over this holiday season to look at a few themes that can hopefully encourage you as we head to what is undoubtedly one of the most divisive holidays of the year. Because Christmas can be lovely, But when family are involved, Christmas can be difficult. So what I want to do from up here is really just encourage you as you head into the Christmas season to keep our focus as a community on Jesus, on his birth, to remind ourselves of what is to come. And there's four themes I want us to look at over the next few weeks. I want to look at the idea that God has a plan for you. That's what we're going to look at today. I want to look at how God has community for you, how God made a way for you, and that God is not far from you. So let's begin. In 1970, the Apollo 13 mission set off. Now, it had intended to become the third uh, mission to the moon in which humanity would be up there in all the glory. But two days into the mission, there was a little bit of a problem. There was an explosion with the oxygen tank, so they had to loop around the moon and come back to Earth. Now, we have the famous misquote here of, uh, you know, Houston, we've got a problem. That's what I always thought the quote was. This, it's from this mission. Houston, we've got a problem. It sounds so snappy, so sweet. What Jack Swigert actually said was, OK, Houston, we've had a problem here. But apparently, when they were putting the movie together, that wasn't quite punchy enough for Hollywood. So Hollywood thought, we can do better than the original. <laughs> and they came up with, Houston, we've got a problem. But it's actually, OK, Houston, we've had a problem here. Anyway. Those astronauts, they set off from Earth, and they had, the three of them, the hope of stepping onto the moon, of spending about four days up there. In fact, in my reading on the mission, originally it was meant to be two people going up there, and they were only meant to be on the moon for a couple of days. They did some additions and they MacGyvered it, and they were able to fit three people in, and they had planned to stay there for four days. But two days into their mission, it became very apparent They would never get to do that. And it was actually a little bit worse than just a little bit of a hope and desire to be on the moon that was dashed. Here's an overview of the whole incident from Wikipedia, a great source of information. It said, a routine stir of an oxygen tank ignited damaged wire insulation inside of it. It caused an explosion and it vented the contents of both the service module's oxygen tanks into space. Now, oxygen does not... Or be in space naturally, so this is a problem. Without oxygen, which I thought, oh, okay, ugh, you can't breathe, but apparently, not only was it used for breathing, but also for generating electric power. How? No idea, but that's what it says. The service module's propulsion and life support systems therefore could not operate. The command module systems had to be shut down to conserve the remaining resources for re-entry, so it forced the crew to transfer into the lunar module and use it as a makeshift lifeboat. So there they are, 
heading off to the moon with all their hopes and desires and going, yes, we're going to be the third mission on the moon. And now they're in the module, which is meant to take them to the moon, just holding on for dear life. The lunar landing cancelled, mission controllers worked heavily and hard to bring the crew back home alive. Now, I have had unmet expectations in my life, but that is next level. Could you imagine being those three astronauts literally shooting for the moon and missing? It would be devastating. And as I read up on that mission, it got me thinking. What do I do when realities and expectations clash? Because it can be really, really disappointing. We all experienced this growing up. When I was a kid, before mobile phones were regular, they weren't really a thing, yet there was multiple times I was left staring out the window, waiting for a pickup that never came. Something happened, there was a miscommunication with the mums. I remember one day I got up, got my cricket gear, sat by the window, and they never rocked up. It's incredibly disappointing for a kid to be waiting there with no one coming to to pick you up, and my mum's sitting there going, oh, that's sad. It's about as much as she cared about the situation. Thanks, mum. She said, I felt bad for you at the time. I'm like, yeah, okay. Anyway. As I got older, there was other disappointing moments in my life. I remember being in year eight, having a very serious girlfriend at the time, um, and we had planned to meet up at the movies. Now, I didn't know that it was a planned plan. I thought it was more just of a talk. I thought, like, oh, yeah, we'll go see a movie, yeah. But she actually rocked up at the movies, (laughs) and I was at home doing something else. (laughs) And, you know, yeah, right, you haven't exactly got access to wheels anyway, and she couldn't contact me, so the next day I rock up. I'm like, hey, and I got daggers. (laughs) Disappointing for her and for me, because then we broke up not long after that. Becoming an adult, there was disappointment in my life. Um, One year into my own marriage, my parents' marriage dissolved, and I was confronted with the fragility of long-term relationships. And now, having kids, I see things through their eyes. I can see, even though they're small things, just their hope and their desires. Like Azalea coming home expecting us to have pizza. And I said, we're not having pizza. Mum made um, beef stroganoff to which tears and drama filled the air. (laughs) Disappointment is hard to deal with. What about you? I'm sure you know the space that I'm talking about. You've experienced disappointment, that moment where what you hoped would happen and what actually happened collided. Well, I believe we're all in the best of company because being human is to be disappointed. (laughs) As a kid, you grow up expecting the world to act one way, and then as you grow up and see things unfold, you start to realise it's not always how it goes. And disappointment becomes a part of our everyday reality. And the encouraging thing for me is that as I look at the Bible and as I talk to other Christians and as I get to experience Christian community, I realise that even God gets disappointed sometimes. Sometimes the hope that God has for his people and the hope that he has for the community that he leads, sometimes that's not always matching the reality of what happens. So today we're going to zoom in on a story, Luke chapter 2, the birth of Jesus. We're going to camp out there for the next few weeks. But what I want you to hear for today is that God has a plan for you. Your story may be one of disappointment. You may have a story of past hurts, relational pain, but I still believe that God loves you, cares for you, and that he has a plan for you. So we're going to look together at Luke chapter 2, 1 to 7. The slides will be up on the screen, otherwise you can use your Bible. But before we get to reading that, just a little bit about who Luke is. So Luke was someone who investigated the life of Jesus, his activity, his words, what he got up to. And he was sent to do this by a person or a group of people um, who's referred to as Theophilus. And he was just there because this story had started to grip the entire world. Lives were beginning to be changed. People were starting to talk about this guy who lived, who did miracles, who said crazy things, who died. And then, this is the part which really was igniting wildfire around the scene at the time. People were saying, not only did he die, but I saw him alive again. And this is what catapulted this from just a fairy tale of, oh, that's nice, there's someone over there who's done some good things, into something which actually had to shock and face the reality at the time was, I know people who say they saw a man die and then say he is alive again. 
So this story is going everywhere, and a whole bunch of people are going around trying to take a record of the account, and Luke is one of those people. And as a result of his good work, we have access to the good news according to Luke. It's the third book in the Christian Bible, and Luke was even nice enough to tell us why he wrote it in the first place. He said it, says it in his opening paragraph. He says, Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us. Just as they were handed down to us by those from whom were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus. And here's the key. So that you may know the certainty of the things that you have been taught. So in the opening paragraph of Luke's letter, he says, why did he write it? Well, a whole bunch of people are going around trying to record this thing because it's a big deal at the time. The modern day um, equivalent would be whenever big news happens, we see it on the television, we read it in the papers, we see it online, we see it on socials because it's got everyone's attention. Well, back then things worked slower. So everyone was going around trying to write up these accounts. And Luke had the wisdom to go and carefully talk to first hand witnesses of the event to collate it all together so that an orderly account could be created. Why? So that we can know this with certainty the things we have been taught. Here is a record of what has been handed over to you. Now this is very helpful for you and for me because Jesus lived over 2,000 years ago. So it's really nice to have a record of what he said, what he did, who he hung out with, and to hear the story from someone who collected it from I witnesses. And not only that, we actually have four different accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which is, which is really awesome because we get different perspectives of the record of the life of Jesus. So let's have a look at what Luke records about the moment that Jesus enters history, the moment that he is born. And we're going to camp out at this story again to look at how God has a plan for you, God has community for you, God made a way for you, and that God is not far from you and from me. So let's begin Reading. We're going to go through, read it once, and we're going to look at some stuff. He said, In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should take place throughout the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. She gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths, placed him in a manger, because there was no guest room available for them at the inn. For the original audience, 100 years, 200 years, 300 years, after Jesus has already lived, died, rose again and gone back, This was the account of Jesus' life for many individuals. Now, we're lucky enough to have multiple accounts of Jesus' entry into the world, but this is the way that Luke chose to record it. While they were out for a census, Mary, who was pregnant, pledged to be married to Joseph, gave birth to the firstborn, a son. So this is Luke's recording. So let's have a look through this. Through chapter 2, 1 to 7, let's see what we can learn today around how God has a plan for us. So let's read that first part again. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world, and everyone went to their own town to register. Now, this is the state of the people of God at this time, the Jewish people. They're not operating as a theocracy, where God is the leader of the nation. They don't have their own king even leading the people. So already the beginning of Luke's narrative of Jesus coming into the world is painting a picture of the people of God being where the people of God should not be. Because when God set up this whole operation back in the book of Genesis, the idea for God and his people was that they were to live under him. He was going to be the one who oversaw how they lived. They were going to have land which they could freely live within, within the boundaries of God's ultimate authority. And then thirdly, they were going to be people who could go and show other nations, hey, look how awesome it is when God is the one in charge. But here, the Jewish people are ruled over by Romans. Because unfortunately for them, 
They're on a nice piece of land between Syria and Egypt, which Rome wanted to keep transportation open between. So what you have in the geopolitical world at Jesus' time was a balance where Rome just wanted to keep control, but they didn't really care how they did stuff. So you may notice that the high priest was in charge of a lot of day-to-day operations. And if you didn't understand the context of the time, that can be a bit confusing. If they're under Roman authority, why can the high priest... Why did Pontius Pilate, if you know the narrative further along, why did he have to work it out with the high priest to figure out what to do with Jesus? Surely if the Romans are in charge, they could just make a decision. Well, the Romans were smart. They went, we don't really care about how they operate. We just need them to be submissive and to allow us to keep that space open so we can have trade between two parts of our empire. So they struck a deal with them and said, you guys can have the Jewish leader in charge of day-to-day operations, but they will submit to the prefect that we put in place. It's a little bit more complex because there's some families break down and drama. Anyway, but basically, the Jewish people had a level of autonomy, but Rome was really in charge. If Rome put their foot down, they rocked up with the troops, they got their way. And considering that God's heart for his people that w- was that they would be under his authority, that they would have their own land and that they would have the freedom to show the surrounding nations how good life can be, the reality was not being met. The expectation, sorry, for God on his people was not being met. God wanted them to be free, to be under his authority, and to show the other nations, wow, living under God's awesome. But they were under Roman rule. Their land was being used as a site to get through between two major powers. And they had no example to show the other nations how good life could be under rule because they were under Roman rule. So this is the thing. God is confronted with this situation. He wants to get at to work. He wants to be able to show humanity his love for them. He wants to change the narrative. But first, he has to come to terms with the fact that this is the reality of where things are at. And that would have been, I think, very disappointing for God. His hope wasn't being met with what was happening. Let's continue. So Joseph went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married with him and was expecting a child. Now, we read that these days, and we don't even raise an eyebrow of the situation. It's just a simple man going to fill out a census at a local meeting point with his future missus, who happens to be pregnant. These days, fine. Different situation in Jewish Palestine at this time of Jesus. You remember two to three generations ago how important the um, like marriage was, and if you had a child outside of marriage, the social stigma that came even just a few generations ago from that? Well, they have nothing on what happened at the time of Jesus. If there was a particular group of people or person with enough authority who felt shamed or felt dishonored, people would be killed. People would be disowned. People would have to get out of the city. So for Mary to be there unwed and with a child put Mary in a very, very vulnerable position. It put Joseph in a very vulnerable position. But this is the situation in which God decides to do his work through. God surveyed the situation, disappointed by the reality that was there, and he began to move. And so God got to work in the situation, starting to change the narrative. And he did it in a way at the time which, was seeming, which seemed very unconventional. But that's how he chose to work. Let's go on. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born and gave birth to a firstborn son. Beautiful. She wrapped him in cloths, placed him in a manger because there was no guest room for them. Jesus is born, placed in the manger. He's in the world. This is the result of God's activity in the world at this point. A child is born. The child is vulnerable, immature, unaware, poops a lot, cries a lot, does what babies do. It's sort of hard to imagine God coming down and choosing to be in this situation where he's just a vulnerable child. A child who needs to be loved, cared for, have stability. Parents that love him. So the situation that God was confronted with, the work he chose to do, now receives a change in direction when Jesus enters the picture. God actually starts to redeem the situation and wants to change the story. Because the story was going along one path. 
Jewish people, his people, under the rule of the Romans. And there didn't seem to be any relief in sight. And Jesus, took, uh, God took a st- step back and went, I see a bigger picture for not just the redemption of the people I've called so far, but for the redemption of all of humanity, for everyone from that time through to now, for everything, for all of creation. And he starts through a miraculous birth of a child to shift the narrative, to show us love in human form in Jesus. And love in human form starts as a crying, tiny baby, born in a family which was vulnerable at the time. Not in a lovely, nice five-star accommodation, sweet hospital which brings you, what do you call it, the... um, brings you the, the food all the time. I went to, uh, we, we had our baby at Midland, and, uh, all, two children in Midland, two children in Osborne Park, and we got to go and see one of our friends in St. John of God, and they had like fancy room service and everything. I thought, this is, this is where I need to, not for the next one. Oh, anyway. <laughs> it was nice to live vicariously through their lovely room service. Jesus was born in a vulnerable position, but that's how God chose to work at the time. So here's what I want you to hear from this passage today and for you to take away. God was confronted with the reality that did not meet his expectation. God worked within the situation that unfolded and God redeemed the situation to make a new way forward. And here's what I believe. If God can do that on a global scale, If God can go and allow a child to be born miraculously within a geopolitical context which is very insecure and vulnerable, if God can do all of that and organize history to the point where Jesus can live, die, rise again, and the church can explode, then I fully believe that he can work in your life and in mine. If God can hold all of that together with all of the complexity, with all of the narratives, and I think that he can look at you and me in the eye and say, I love you and I have a plan for you. If you follow me. You may have been born into unfair circumstances. You may have made decisions that didn't meet the expectations of those that loved you. You may have had someone treat you unfairly in your life. But I have faith that God can meet you in your situation. He can work with who you are and produce a hope in you for a future. A future that restoration is possible, even though it may not be in this life, it may be in the life to come. Now with time and faith, you see that God has a plan for your life. That you're more than just on this earth to just exist, to just consume, to just be, to just try and live life up to all the pleasures that you can possibly do. I believe that God made you and me with purpose to show his love to a broken world, to partner with Jesus in showing others what life can be when we live under God's ultimate authority, which is in relationship with him, as he designed in the beginning, as he desires for all of humanity. Could you imagine this Christmas, the impact on our world, if the people who followed Jesus took our cue from God? Could you imagine for a second? Christmas is a time of rushed present buying, family tension, disappointment when your plan doesn't get picked and the other plan gets picked or whatever it might be or you got the wrong gift or something happened, someone snubbed your child in the school play or whatever it might be. (laughs) Didn't happen, just saying. Christmas is a time where emotions are high and it can just feel like a lot. And for some of us, maybe this is your story, Christmas is a time where you step back and say, I'm just going to step out for a few weeks. Because it's just too much going on. Could you imagine if we took our cue from God? For those of us whose lives have been impacted by the story of Jesus, if our faith has been increased over time because of what God has done in our lives, if we take our cue from Jesus, when our expectations do not meet reality, we choose to embrace the mess and work within it to bring about love, to bring about hope, to bring about perspective that there is a God that loves you and loves me. If as Christians this Christmas, as Jesus followers this Christmas, when things go wrong, when the plan doesn't unfold quite how we want it to, we take a deep breath, look around, step into the mess and just be as loving as we can. Be as patient as we can, as kind as we can. I believe the fruit of the Spirit is given to us so that in any situation we have at our disposal, 
a character that is worthy of the love that Jesus has shown to you and to me. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness. There's always an opportunity. And at Christmas, there's many opportunities to extend love, peace, patience. Always a chance to extend patience. There's always an opportunity to extend those to those around us. And it's not just at Christmas time we need to remember when expectation and reality don't meet, that we need to embrace the mess and work within the situation. In our marriages, in our singleness, in our parenting, with our family, through divorce, through riches, through poverty, through young age and through old age. When we're disappointed, when we feel like things just haven't hit the mark, we have an opportunity to take our cue from God and to go, how can I step into this and extend love? Even though sometimes, if we're honest, they don't always deserve it. But that's the beauty of God working with us, is that when Jesus extended love to you and to me, I don't think I deserved it. And that's the beauty of the grace and the gospel, is that it's something that's been given to us, an opportunity to receive from God a relationship with his one and only son, not because we've done anything to earn it, but because he loves us, because he chooses us, because he wants to restore the relationship with us. So I'm going to give you some homework for this week, if you don't mind. And it's a really simple, simple task. One of the ways that you can communicate with God, uh, you can read your Bible, you can go into nature, uh, you can meditate, you can operate in silence, you can talk to people in community, um, life groups are a great place for that. You can do all sorts of things. But one of the key ways that we talk to God is by just talking to God. Simple, right? It's called prayer. And uh, one of the beautiful things is that wherever we are and we pray, God can hear us. I love talking to my daughter about prayer because um, she went through a phase where she was trying to test. So she's like, so God can hear me in the bathroom? Yes. God can hear me when I've got my eyes closed? Yes. God can hear me when I'm outside? Yes. God can hear me when I'm under the covers? Yes. Anyway, it went on for a long time. And I was just trying, and now she knows, like, God can hear me anywhere. So the homework for this week is really simple. If you're sitting there right now and you feel like, I don't know if God has a plan for me. I've lived this life, I've been disappointed by this life, and it just doesn't seem like if there is a God who's out there, it doesn't seem like he's good, or if he is good, it doesn't seem like he's interested. Then what I want to challenge you to do this week is to just say one simple prayer, one time. Worst case scenario, you talk to yourself in a weird sentence. Best case scenario, God rocks up and does something in your life. So here's, here it is, simple prayer. God, I don't feel like you have a plan for my life. Can you show me if there is one? That might be you this morning. Maybe you're at home sitting there and you're just thinking, yeah, it's all great to go and talk about God and his activity, but I don't feel like he's active in my life. Maybe you just need to take an opportunity this week, shut the door, go under the covers, whisper it really quietly, and just go, God, I don't know if you have a plan for my life. But if you're there, if you're real and if you're active, can you show me what it is? Now, if you're sitting here this morning and you're like, yep, I know God has a plan for my life. Um, I've seen his activity in my world and I've been encouraged by his community and my faith is at a point where I can say, yes, I follow Jesus 100%. Sometimes that idea that God has a plan for our life can sort of fall to the background and we just start to operate out of reflex or habit. So sometimes it's good to remind ourselves, yeah, God does have a plan for my life. He has equipped me, shaped me and given me all that I need to partner with him while here on this earth. So maybe we just need a bit of a refresher. So maybe this week for you, as you pray, you can be saying, God, I know you have a plan for me. I know you're there. I know you're real. I know that you have a plan for me. Can you make it real for me once again? Can you show me? Can you remind me? Can you remind me that you haven't given me these awesome gifts, talents, opportunities to just benefit me while I live, but they've actually been given to you and to me to show other people how good God is. And that's the parallel we have between us and the people that God originally called back at the beginning. When God called his people to rise up and to be the people of Israel, he said, I want you to be blessed. I want you to have a space to be. And I want you to tell others how amazing it is to live under my authority. And now through Jesus, we have sort of the same charge. I want you to be blessed. I want you to have a space to operate. It's no longer in the Middle East. We're operating in... Perth, 
Australia or wherever you are if you're listening online. And not only that, but I want you to partner with me in telling other people how awesome life can be when I'm the one that's in charge of it all. And when I say awesome, I don't mean life is always good. Life still sucks at times. Life is still hard at times. But knowing that God is with me, knowing that his people are with me, knowing that my faith can carry me, gives me a hope for tomorrow, even when today looks dark. And as we approach Christmas, I think we need to remind ourselves, God is with us. He has a plan for us. Sometimes we just need to ask him to show us it or show us it again. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the narrative we have in Luke. Thank you that when the world wasn't how it was meant to be, you didn't sit back and allow it to continue. You stepped in and you made a difference. You stepped in through your one and only son, Jesus, and he became love in human expression. So right for today, Lord, I just pray that you remind us that in the mess of our lives, when it seems like there is nothing good, nothing good could come out of us, Remind us, Lord, that you've called us to follow you and that you have a plan for our lives. You've equipped us. You've given us what we need. And I just pray that we're faithful in living under your authority as disciples of Jesus, as followers of him. In your name and for your glory. Amen.